Everybody, welcome back to another Post Edits Live. This is where we do uh, webinars and interviews with our awesome members at Post Edits. And today we've got a great, talented team from Modern Tribe. I'm going to let them unpack a little bit more about what Modern Tribe does and what they do at Modern Tribe. But today our topic is going to be the right approach to WordPress accessibility. This kind of this really came to the forefront for us and why I sought these experts out because accessibility is a non-negotiable for the web. Um, and they're going to talk more about their passion, their experiences, their expertise around that. But I will just say this is a topic that we need to be talking about more. And we're specifically doing this webinar, and I've asked them to come on and share their particular areas and work in accessibility with WordPress. But if you're a leader, you're a developer, you're a designer, um, starting to embark on a, on a website project and want, rightly so, to make sure your website is accessible to all people, this is, this is the extended webinar for you. We're going to talk about a lot. We're going to talk about how does a C-suite or leadership team properly resource and lead uh, in the accessibility projects for your organization, all the way down to the developers, the designers, the people that use the website every single day to make sure you're doing your best for those trying to access your website. So um, I want to introduce these these uh, this team today, but I'm going to let you do that. So Mike, could you start us off and share um, a little bit about what you do with with uh, uh, your work at Modern Tribe and a, your interest in this whole topic of accessibility. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Um, my name is Mike Klanick. I am the Director of Business Development at Modern Tribe. Um, that's essentially a sales role here. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to talk more about accessibility. Um, I, you know, to be transparent, I was actually a little nervous at first uh, because of my role is essentially a sales role. And um, this is such an important topic. And, and Corey, in like preparing for this, you said something that, that resonated with me, which is that, you know, if this is important, um, don't feel bad about being an advocate for it and talking about it. Um, so uh, that helped build my confidence. So I'm excited to be here to talk more, especially about uh, accessibility as it relates to leadership and as it relates to a core value that stretches across all components of your business. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think we'll continue on with introductions and maybe I could circle back and, and tell you a little bit more about uh, Tribe and how long we've been around. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to you. But I think, you you know, one compelling reason you're here, too, is because you do talk to people that are making decisions, but not necessarily always the people doing the work, too. And it's a collaborative approach. And I know your heart, you're super super humble, but very experienced um, <laughs> professional. So I'm really glad to have you on here. And you're going to talk first as we, after we do introductions about the whole leadership angle for all of this. Um, Chris, then Sarah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Chris Kindred. I am a director of backend um, engineering here at Modern Tribe. Um, I, accessibility has always been a passion of mine. Um, and it's been uh, really great to come on board at somewhere like Modern Tribe where they take accessibility so seriously. So uh, that's always been a, a great thing for, for me um, moving forward. So, yeah. Hi, right. I'm Sarah Glass. Thanks, Chris. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Sarah Glass. I'm the creative director at Modern Tribe. Ultimately, that means I'm in service to both our clients, making sure that we're shipping incredibly beautiful and, and, and engaging work, um, as well as our design team, ensuring that you know they're fulfilled in, in the work that they're doing and we're continuously developing and pushing the work forward. Um, I'm super passionate about accessibility too. You know, I think that as you know, coming from a design background, um, ultimately I want to communicate effectively with 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 people. And um, if if you cut off people in those lanes of communication, um, how good is that design? So I, I truly believe that good design is accessible design. Um, super excited to, to be here and, and chat more about that. I can't wait to dig in with all three of you because what you just said, Sarah, is good, good accessibility is good design. And I think there's probably a lot of designers out there that just kind of like, oh, okay, we can do this. So I'm looking forward to talking more about that particularly. Um, 
I'm so, hype them up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This can be, you know, that's a, another message in all this. This can be done. There is an approach, a good approach to it. And it is possible. And I think that's a really great message. Um, so Mike, before we kind of get into the actual topics, could you tell us a little bit more about Modern Tribe as an agency? Sure, sure. I'll give you the short version. So um, Modern Tribe, we like to call ourselves a full service digital design and development agency. Um, we've been around for about 15 years now uh, and recently joined the Liquid Web family of brands. Um, I think like one of the way, another way we describe ourselves is we say we connect to the touch points of your digital ecosystem. Um, and when I say that, I think what's important to note is kind of that WordPress is often the center. It's the hub. The WordPress CMS is the hub of that ecosystem. So we lean on, on WordPress heavily. Um, and our, our business, I mean, it sort of breaks down into four key categories. There's strategy, there's content, there's design, there's engineering. Um, and that's sort of who we are. Um, accessibility, the topic at hand today, uh, as you'll see, it, it sort of permeates all of those areas. And it's sort of core to who we are um, as an organization. So, um, yeah, we're a WordPress agency. And I know you all work with some name brand organizations. Maybe you can't all talk about it, but I'm aware enough to know that you all have worked with some of the biggest brands that are household names, helping them specifically, not just with their web, but also that this important part, accessibility. And some of these organizations, Mike, particularly, I know from talking with you all background about this is if you take federal funding in any way, particularly in the United States, it, it's not even a conversation about is it is it a thing we should do? It's like, no, you do it. And I think that amps this up even more. Um, thankfully, government nonprofits have led the way with accessibility, but this is something we'll talk more about is like, everybody should be doing this. Um, this is, this. is We're in 2023 now today, and it this is just a part. And I'm that's why another reason I'm glad, but you all work with these organizations where you're like, there's a lot of scrutiny on these organizations you work with. That means that that's a good thing in a way because, they have to make sure, like Sarah was saying, that this website is accessible for anyone that wants to to access it. So uh, I think that's pretty critical cool and also demonstrates why I asked Modern Tribe and you three to come on to talk about this today. So, okay, here's the layout. We're going to talk about leadership. Um, now, for those of you watching and listening, um, we're going to each, each of the experts I've asked to talk about a specific area related to their expertise, but you're going to hear from them. I've told them, I said, I don't want you to just stay silent or Mike's part, Chris part, or Sarah's part. I want you to contribute too, because as we've talked and prepared for this, it's helped me understand this is a holistic process that everybody in the organization needs to embrace. And so again, I'll, I'll just say to you all, please, if Mike's talking, share something from your perspective about this, uh, please do that. Because I think this is going to help people. Our intention here is you're trying to do right and good by this for your website project. So I want you all to like help them really understand these are the things we work with clients about. These are the problems we see. These are the challenges we see. And here's our thoughts. Because you, you are experts in this and you see things that I think could make those trying to cross this threshold um, truly be prepared for and make really good decisions that helps everybody involved, even if they don't choose Modern Tribe as the agency. So again, I think that's right important. Okay, so let's just start right here because oftentimes, as I understand this, both leading my own organizations, listening to you all and other agency members that post this, I go, um, this type of decision needs to start at the, you know, the top of the hierarchy here. If the leaders aren't on board or don't fully understand it, this is going to be a problem. So I hope those leaders listening, this is your time to take notes because Mike, I, I want you to kind of, what do you think of when you're saying, okay, I am, let's say a CEO of an organization or in the C-suite or leadership team, I need to start helping think through this, you know, accessibility for what we do on the web. What stands out to you when we talked about leadership and WordPress accessibility? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad we get to talk about it from this perspective, because so often accessibility can get pretty dense and technical right away. Um, but in today's modern world, uh, 
it, it's more than that. And it's something that permeates all aspects of your business if you want it to be successful. And therefore, it often has to start with leadership um, realizing why it's an, important. Um, it's it's got to be built as a core consideration um, to all of those various layers. Uh, and the best organizations, the really effective organizations that care and are considerate of their users, make this a, a core value. It's It literally becomes um, part of the culture, uh, top to bottom. Um, so I think one of the ways to build that understanding is to really think about like why you're doing this. And we hit on the legal implications initially. And I think that's where a lot of people first start thinking about this for some reason. But you kind of need to back up and really remember that one of the first reasons this is important is, is just morally. It's, it's morally important. It's a part of digital inclusivity. We are creating tools that serve users, that serve people, and therefore we need to care for them. We need to think about how they use it, and that applies to all of the users. It's an increasingly competitive world. We don't have the luxury of um, excluding people because it's not convenient to um, build tools that serve them effectively. So I think like we really need to ground ourselves in the moral component of this first, which is it's the right thing to do. It's just the right thing to do. Therefore, needs to be a leadership initiative. It needs to be brought and carried through to all components, all layers of your business. Okay, so that's like the first thing that I would probably tell a leader in this space is that make it a part of all of your thinking. I mean, you know, I we were talking about a client I used to consult with before we started recording, and I was like, you could tell they're the client one did the traditional thing, print off your core values, put it on all the doors. And you're like, cool. Yeah. But what are your real core values? And it seems to me, as you talk about one, there is a business reason to do this very legitimate. That's going to get a lot of people's attention. But I think what you were, you're saying is like, it should reflect a value that you might not have on the door, but like we care. Yes. We yeah. care about the whole population and being able to get to the things that we offer. And if we don't, it, it, I mean, that rings really true when you say that business, there's a legitimate business reason. And that should hopefully check most boxes. But I think the other thing is that you should actually just care. We've yeah. all probably been touched in some way with someone that has uh, 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 something that doesn't allow them to see, read, hear, whatever that is, um, that we need to be thinking about that just because we don't have that particular issue doesn't mean there's a pretty significant one is it significant enough to me, but I mean, this we're talking about in this accessibility conversation, quite a bit of the population that most organizations have flatly not even thought about till today. Exactly. Yeah. I think it just sends the right message. You know, when you're the type of organization that takes the time to be deliberate and considerate of all of your users there's probably an understanding that that carries through to your product. If you're selling something, um, you, your service, your, your organization as a whole. So um, it's just the right thing to do. And I think, I think we should just start there as it's, it's morally right. And as you hit on um, and to segue a little bit, there are legitimate business reasons. So um, making sure that your, your site is fully accessible has this effect of, improving the quality, the experience for your users. And that sort of, in some ways, overlays these other topics that we often talk about as like key performance indicators for businesses, things like search engine optimization, um, core web vitals. Um, these are adjacent to each other. So it, it's about creating an experience that is a user experience that's quality for everyone. And therefore your, your business will feel that it'll have an impact. Um, so not only is it the right thing to do morally, a, a highly accessible site, that's going to benefit your, your clicks, your conversions, and all those things that we spend so much time thinking about. Um, and that we're starting to, to kind of like, land a couple of really important reasons. It's like, you know, it's what's good as a person. It's what's good for business. Um, it, th those alone are, are enough reason, right? To really think long and hard about this. Um, but 
there is this final one too, which is the one we kind of backed into this from, which was there's some legal requirements here. I I, I pulled a stat, and I think everyone's aware of this, but um, 2,800 accessibility lawsuits in 2021. Um, that's that's like it's a big deal, and those lawsuits um, are meaningful, and there's a place for them. Um, but more important than the litigation itself is you just have an opportunity to get ahead of this if you do things right. And that can get confusing. Um, I saw you're going to jump in. I'll take a beat. Yeah, no, I, I think um, I'm curious to hear what Chris and Sarah think too, because it's like, you know, we've all been to those situations uh, where you're like, the organization talks a really good talk, yeah. you know? And we've got plenty of those in our society globally today. But you know the ones that talk and you know the ones that just act on that value. And I think this shines pretty clearly, whether you go to a website, you see the accessibility blue circle or whatever this is. And I think this is an opportunity. I'm curious what Chris and Sarah think too, from just an organization standpoint of like, when you see someone taking it to this degree, not because they necessarily have to, a lot of these have to, but and there's a probably a legitimate reason why there's regulations and laws and different things in these lawsuits is because like, okay, if you're not going to do the right thing, the, the world society will kind of push you in that regard. But I think, I'm curious what you think, Chris and Sarah, is like, this is a way to get out front and lead, act on those values. You can't just say you care, but if you care enough to make sure your website is A to B, everybody can can access that and, and consume the information and whatever you're trying to offer in the world. That's an opportunity for leadership to me. So Sarah, Chris, what do you think? I, yeah. I, uh, okay. Uh, I, I think there's a huge opportunity there. One of the things we tend to hear is, well, that's not the kind of person we're marketing to. And, you know, there's, there's so much more than that going on with, accessibility it's you know you may not be marketing to them right now but who knows what's going to happen in the future they they uh or or um friends that they have but that that kind of thing they can help um push along whatever product you're pushing in in those cases so you know you've got um you've got companies that come at it from that angle and and there's a little bit of education that we have to do to help kind of get them over that hump of this this is this is a moral thing as well. <laughs> it's it's not who you're marketing to. It is that you are marketing to everybody. Everyone's going to see it, and it's important that everybody be able to see it. Yeah, and I think that like going back to Mike's original point, like it takes the organization to do that. It cannot be on the shoulders of like your web team. Um, yes, they are like hands on producing and shipping that thing. Um, but that thing should be symbolic of like a much larger um, um, effort around accessibility. Um, and, and your kind of example around, you know, posting your, your core values as a, as a company on the wall um, and accessibility or inclusivity being on that um, kind of made me start to think like, what's like a real example of, of this? Um, you know, like I, I think transferring that responsibility not transferring but sharing that responsibility across the organization means you have to figure out like how can each department take part in that um, how can we better collaborate on that mission um, I think you know I've spent a lot of time on and and working with like brand and marketing teams great opportunity for 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 people to get involved in accessibility that may not be um, on the line to like ship that that website necessarily. Um, for example, we mentioned, you know, calling out your brand values, maybe you've got, you know, being inclusive as as, as a brand value. Well, back that up with like, you know, shipping accessible designs on the marketing side. So like if you're working on a brand book, um, a big part of that is establishing a color palette. Um, and that color palette has implications across so much of your collateral across the organization, including that website. Now, oftentimes what happens on like design um, is that we're handed a brand book with colors we can't use. And now we're having to rework that because accessibility was never a consideration going into that. Um, so that's like a, a very, you know, tech, like tactile example of, of how one little shift, you know, like, and if your team doesn't have the specialties to do that, that's okay. Like lean on a team of experts to help 
and collaborate on that. So bring in the web team into you know that brand conversation and when you're developing that color palette or or whatever the thing is um, to get their expertise and 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 make sure that we're living up to that kind of you know core tenant of being inclusive and accessible and also um beyond just being like the right thing to do like you know if you do work ahead the more you work ahead on accessibility the more money you'll save down the road um, because you don't have to rework as much so um definitely another you know kind of business um, opportunity. And I, I think, thanks for that. Oh, Chris, go ahead. But that, that just made me start thinking. Um, one of the things is accessibility doesn't just stop with your digital things. Um, I, there's, there's a billboard I drive past or used to drive past all the time. And I could barely read it because it was blue on blue. And it just didn't didn't work well for for me as I was driving a car 60 miles an hour past it. If you're going to put that your uh, that accessibility and, and being inclusive as part of your core values, that trickles into your billboard. That trickles yeah. into the entryway to your business. That that trickles into so many other things in order Great to prove it. It's a mind it is. shift, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. when you when you yeah when and. But, it, but once you start doing and get in the practice of that and resource for it, that's a critical part of this, right? Um, you, you, it will become a habit and, and that's a good habit to have. And I keep shaping this mic in my mind as it's a, it's a problem, but if we can do what you just said, Sarah, and shift your mind, we go, this is an opportunity to show people we care. We don't have to put the word on there. If we do certain things like this, just like we've mentioned, diversity, equity, inclusion, huge topic and rightly so this is going if we truly want to act on that we need to think about that person who might be blind and trying to exit like you were talking about you know the color palettes and things it's to that thought but mike it seems like too i think chris and both sarah have helped me to think like let's add another reason here this is a team morale thing mm -hmm. hey we care so we're doing this accessibility project and, and other initiatives in the business side of things that they can do to say, we're not just going to say it, we're going to do it. I mean, this seems like right. when you go to your team, like Sarah was saying, and you're like, hey, leadership is bought in on this and understands mm -hmm. it. Now we go to the team. We want, hey, we want everyone as best it, as we can to do to, to be able to access things. It's a it's a foundational um, shift in how you think about it. So. A small example would be we used to um, ask, do you need your site to be accessible? And now we just assume we're going to build accessible sites. And we used to take a pass at estimating a project and then sort of like do some additional math to calculate accessibility. Now we assume accessibility is a part of every estimate that you're doing. Every line item of the feature level estimate incorporates accessibility thinking. Um, and that's and that's that changes the approach. It's it starts at the beginning. It carries through all the way to the end. And I I think I would be remiss not to mention one other topic on leadership that this conversation has sort of reminded me of, which is that these standards we're talking accessibility is sort of this like like just just this open ended term, but it it means probably slightly different things. And from a leadership standpoint, I think one other thing you need to really consider is what standard are you in some cases mandated to hit and just understanding that is part of the leadership obligation because you're the person that may often understand where you're doing business what your jurisdictions are um what what laws you're bound to and if you're as an international organization we we work with groups in europe we work with groups in california we we work with groups that have different sets of requirements and different guidelines so i think an important note for anyone who's who's going to try to build this philosophy into their organization as they should uh, is to to like really fundamentally set some clear guidelines to your team and say that based on where we do business and where we're approaching it the way we're approaching it we're going to try to hit you know stay tuned to section 508 um and, and the, the outlines set in wicag 21 double a like we there needs to be some basis for what you're aiming towards. Uh, it doesn't doesn't mean that um, you can't go past that, um, but uh, you probably need to have that guiding light. Uh. 
And I think there's a relief for me talking to you on this too, because when I know, for instance, this is a value, right? That we want to, that I love you said, uh, just it's assumed, you know, we're in 2023 having this conversation. It doesn't matter what's been in the past today. This is just an assumption that mind shape shift, um, but that it occurs to me, you know, as a leader, and then we've all kind of talked this and know this, we can't know every single thing. Like you're talking about these specific legislation, policies, regulations out there. You can't possibly. So, but I want to say there's hope. That's why we're having this conversation. That's why there's great experts in WordPress overall, Tribe being one of them, that um, can help navigate some of those. Like it doesn't need to be the the thing that you keep up with at the absolute. That's why you hire people like you all to even mention some of these things. Like I've been in tech a long time and I learned something when I'm talking about when to you all about these things that I hadn't considered. And I think that's a maybe a sense, Mike, is like there's a little bit of relief. You can say like you want to do the right thing. That's why you go f- seek out experts that do. That's why I've enjoyed preparation about this. I've learned a ton that I wouldn't even yep. consider. Like Sarah, you were talking about the brand and I go more design, yeah. Chris, than tech sometimes because I don't know what I'm talking about with tech all the time. <laughs> but I go, take this thought and go to your brand values. We have orange is ours, but I have no idea how that expresses itself necessarily uh, on the web for someone that's hurt. And that's a holistic thing. We're thinking like we, we've hit this do, do good. And it's got a pretty dang good benefit because it's like, Absolutely. you can actually reflect and show what you're doing. So. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And you mentioned like, kind of like leaning on, on experts and that kind of got me thinking, like, I think there's this expectation. Um, I know design designers put this expectation on them to, to um, sometimes to, to be able to like have expertise in this. And like, we absolutely have to have, you know, baseline knowledge and and skills that apply to our work to meet accessibility. But, um, you know, as an organization, if you're in a marketing team, um, for example, and you're like, do I I need to know everything about accessibility? No, and there's no, I mean, accessibility is a, you know, a full team of effort um, yeah. um, mm-hmm. at Modern Tribe. We've got a full dedicated QA team that is testing rigorously everything we design and build. Um, so, so no, but can you get to a place where you've got like a good baseline knowledge of accessibility and or also like resources that you know you can turn to, whether it be um, your own team internally that's focused on accessibility, your leadership has resource for awesome, or um, if you can work with consultants or agencies like us or, or what, whoever, um, get that, that resource embedded in your team so you can turn to them um, for their expertise. Because accessibility is like this ever-changing thing that will continue to grow. Um, and, and I just wanna like, I think that's something like in my own past, I put that pressure on myself and um, mm-hmm. it's a lot of pressure and it can, can kind of, um, um, get you away from other, you know, priorities within your role. So acknowledge that you do not have to um, necessarily be experts in accessibility, but you do have like a moral and business responsibility to care about it and get help when you need it. Um, um, so, yeah, I think I think that's that. That's a great point. Um, yeah. And on all this, um, and now we're going to shift to you in just a moment to talk specifically about design, Sarah, but Mike, before we do that, I just want to make sure, I think we've hit really big pillars here. Um, moral business requirement, it's just the right, it could be, there's an opportunity here to lead and show that you truly care. Uh, anything else you think about when you're, when you're thinking about leaders making these decisions, wanting to give those resources to design and team and things like that, anything else that we missed that you want to share? Just to like summarize, it's a tremendous opportunity. It went from being a, a challenge, a problem to, no, this is just an opportunity to better serve our, our audience. Um, and that's how I would be thinking about it. Yeah. What a great mind shift and what a great takeaway. We have more. So if you're a leader in an organization making these decisions, stay on because there's more, because this is a, we're, we're evolving and growing this concept. Like we've been saying as a mind shift shift change over what a great great way to sum up that mike thank you okay so sarah now let's just talk creative 
and design because a part of this, I'll just say this. I was like, okay, I can get the decision. Like I can really embody that and go, it's, it will take time. It will take effort. It will take money. But as we're talking, I go, gosh, I've been in the seat too, where you're a marketing person or you're trying to ship the work into through the website and there's decisions and things that you need to be thinking about that. So as we talk about in this role, creative and design, what, what things stick out to you as we approach the accessibility topic? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I think just acknowledging that it is a requirement. Um, I think that there's this kind of stigma that accessible design, um, pro, you know, prohibits creativity um, in a way that, you know, accessibly designed websites are ugly, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, and I think that that stems from, you know, a history of, of, hearing about lawsuits and, and, and building requirements around certain sectors, um, particularly like the government um, and websites for governments or government um, institutions are, are, are typically not known for um, their design. There are a few, of course. <laughs> um, so it's, it, you know, accessibility, I think, in the design world has a, a, a reputation that it's going to restrict me. Um, and I don't like to think about that. Like that, I, I I want you know our design team. We we sh we we have a mindset that it's just an, a requirement. And any creative brief you get, um, I'm sorry, but it's going to have requirements on it. Um, and so if you think about that and shift your mind into thinking that way, it truly does become a creative opportunity um, and a creative challenge. And um, I think designers and creatives tend to work very well if you give them some structure, but then opportunities to innovate. And there's tons of opportunities to do that with accessibility. Um, I think of like a past project we worked on for um, a very well-known uh, Ivy League uh, school um, that, you know, we designed a, a navigation. It was very robust. It was very um, uh, boundary pushing, I'll say, on the design side. And at first blush, it did not look like it was going to meet accessibility. Um, we worked and collaborated with our QA team, our engineering team, um, and within those boundaries of accessibility and th th those requirements um, and looking at this thing that we really wanted to like put live into the world, we figured it out um, and we shipped a very accessible um, site and navigation that ended up winning a design award. Like you can do it. It's totally possible. Does it take more resources and time? Yes, but it's like, you know, yes, um, there's just no way around that, but yes, um, but you, it, it's, it, it truly can actually lead to like innovative ideas because um, even within mm -hmm. those requirements, there's, there's bars to push and like uh, uh, figure out how to, to um, uh, make this work. So, yeah. I think what you're saying, so I fancy myself sometimes justified or not as a creative. And what I hear when you say that is I know there's a bunch of people when you said the first part, it feels like it could prohibit. They're probably like, yeah, it feels that way. But then you spun it around and you said, this is an opportunity here. I, I When I fancy myself as a creative, I go, constraints are actually really good in a lot of cases. And so if if it's a challenge, hey, you give, you're given these tools, take it and be creative. Like, that's what I got from that example you just gave is like, we looked at it potentially as an obstacle, but we turned it into an opportunity to be really creative and make it work. And I think that's part of like, I'll get a little ethereal here and say artistic. Like when you say you're creative, it means like, don't look at these as problems, look at them as opportunities. You know, that's the thing we got with leadership. It seems like that's what I just, I wrote it down. I was like, we're talking about how this challenge can be viewed as an opportunity. And for creatives, having worked with some creatives, I'm like, hey, see what you can do. Like yeah, the best exactly. things. See what you, yeah. See what you can get away with. <laughs> no. As a definite. Yeah. Little rebellious. Like, <laughs> as a definite not creative, I really think this is an interesting part of the conversation. And Somewhere out there, well, this is the part that I can add. I can add that there's an article about like Jack White and the White Stripes. There's this like idea of threes where they stay within three colors, three instruments. And that that parameter 
within that, they try to push innovation as much as possible. And clearly they've been successful with it. So. Absolutely. That's awesome. I, and you know, like, oh, go ahead, Chris. I, I feel like there's another aspect specifically to the, the um, menu that you're, that you're talking about there. As a technical team, when we look at a menu that came in like that, we're, we're looking at it going, oh, there's, this is going to be difficult. <laughs> yeah. And the, the amazing part is, though, it just takes some communication. It takes the team working together to figure out, okay, here's where we can push a boundary. We, we, we know how to handle this piece. And we get that developed. We, we work with you know, our, our, our front end team does an amazing job at staying up to date with things like WCAG and, and we can really lean on them in, in some of these cases to say, okay, here's how you can accomplish this in an accessible way. And then with, with good communication between design and, and our, our engineering team, we can, we can keep pushing those boundaries. Uh, you, you mentioned that it costs more. It does cost more to be innovative. Like that, that's just part of being on the front end of the curve, right? If you're trying to push boundaries, it's going to cost more, but accessibility doesn't have to cost more either. The innovation piece of it is what's costing more. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're wanting to, to do a big award-winning nav, heck yeah, let's do it. Let's jump in, let's, let's do it together. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way to be accessible either. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that multidisciplinary kind of approach is so critical. Um, I think it requires both specialization and a willingness like multidisciplinary collaboration across teams to, to do it right. Well, and we talked a lot about boundaries, pushing boundaries, and it seems to me too, it's like there's probably some mental boundaries we put ourselves in if we think about it as just, oh, this is a problem and I don't want to do it. But I think what I hear from you too, Sarah, is like, well, this, the, the regulations, the policies, the things that govern this have actually created your canvas. You know, if we look at it like that yeah, and exactly. we go- and then I love the challenge, actually, like Chris going like, well, what can we, cool. like even cross teams, we got a challenge, but let's look at it as this opportunity to do something really cool. Like when you said the awards and stuff, like, you're like, do such a good job with this challenge that you could actually win hearts and awards, you know? Exactly. And I think that's for creative people. I think that's got to be a stoking fire of like motivation oh, and inspiration. Yeah. So that like nav wins an award ranks high on accessible websites in higher ed. Like that, what, I mean, that's just a perfect pair. <laughs> and that so. person out there trying to look, trying to do, see, hear, whatever to that information, they've, they've had these experts giving their creative talent to do it. So there's that other part of like, somebody got to make sure they didn't miss that part of the website or whatever was happening in the project. So exactly. like, how many wins do we need people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and Chris, you're going to get your chance to talk tech too. Um, but I really, I really love this. Like the words I hear from you, Sarah, particularly as a designer, you know, artistic and creative, you go, you said, doesn't have to restrict, doesn't have to pro prohibit it. It can actually blossom and grow your creativity. If you, if you look again, we're talking about mind shifts and we say, Hey, this is just the canvas I get to create on. I love that. So what else comes to your mind when we talk when you're talking to creative teams and people really trying to make sure the experience is great? What other things like pop up to you as you've worked with clients and and the teams? Yeah, yeah, I I think uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but just taking the knowing that you don't have to be an expert at this thing, like. And really, again, I can't hit home enough, like collaborating and, and building kind of an extension of your team to support accessibility is so critical um, and putting resources towards that, um, whether that's in-house or, or with an agency. Um, you know, I look at our own design team as a great example. Like we, we definitely stay up on knowledge or as it affects you know, the, the work that we're working on. Um, but even our team who is talking about accessibility all the time, 
we still have, have experts specifically dedicated to accessibility within our organization, our QA team, who we can collaborate and lean on to ensure that the work that we're designing and putting out into the world is tr truly accessible. And so I, I just wanna really hit home, like if you, if you um, are feeling maybe a little overwhelmed, like how do, how do I do this? Lean on people who know how to do it. Um, and um, yeah. I think you all have modeled that for me in our discussions leading up to this. You really have modeled it. We, I won't get into the exact details, but when I was saying, hey, we're gonna, okay, we got our date and all that. You all started asking these questions. I was like, I didn't think about that. And they were accessibility questions, like naturally. But what I really, really appreciate about you three, why we're like working with really super talented people that are also humble, is you all team approach that. I think Sarah, you're like, okay, I think I think it's this, but let me, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go chase that with a team. Chris, right. same way. And you guys were collaborating. And I think what you all have modeled, what you're talking about the client should do is really look at this like it's not on one particular person yeah embrace the team concept we we care and that's why as a team we're going to figure this out together yeah yeah it's a, a perpetually changing topic it's guidelines are evolving browsers are evolving the tools that people use are always changing so if you're an expert one day, by the next day, you have more learning to do. And the way that we get around that is by leaning on each other as a team uh, and thinking about it as sort of a topic that we all need to stay fresh on um, and just care about. I mean, this whole conversation evolved because you and I were talking, Mike, you know, and I'm aware of the work you all do. And, you know, through us talking, you go, got to have Chris, got to have Sarah on this call. That's my, that's you have Absolutely. a bigger team. You all have a bigger team, of course, but you're like, that's a great model. So like we had you start with leadership and making those decisions. And then we're going to talk about creativity. And then we're going to talk about tech. And then you all have even let and say, there's somebody else that might not be in that spec, but they're the ones publishing the post or whatever it is to the site. Exactly. And yeah. I think we've modeled this like cross-disciplinary. I think you said that too, Sarah, is like, okay, we... When we're having these conversations, we do need leadership, we do need tech, we do need design, and probably the people actually doing this, the work like into the world probably all need to be somehow represented in that conversation. So I think I'm, I'm digressing from your subject, Sarah, but I just go, I think that just, again, models, it's a holistic, whole team approach. We're, we're not going to get it perfect, but we're going to figure it out together. Absolutely. So I, I love that too. I think you've given permission to take some <laughs> burden off Sarah is like, yes, you don't as have to be the aid. <laughs> as long as you lean on, on, on your, your internal teams or consultants in that, in that area. Care, lean on your team, yes. try to make the best decisions, get the best experience. You may not win the award every single time, but Hey, allowing someone to do that, which probably has a, I can't imagine the frustration someone might feel trying to get access to this cool tool called the internet, but oh. tripped up, like one of the best communication tools ever invented in human history, yet there's a significant part of our population that can't get to it. Yeah, it's like in the States, one in four um, have a disability, and I think globally it's one in six. Like, think about those numbers. It's like 25% in the U.S. That, can, that you may not be communicating with today huh. on your website. I uh, see, again, you just go like, so let's, let's make this for a second, Mike. I'm curious about this, but you two chime in. You go, if we were going to say, like, just make it a business decision. If I went to any corporate leader, business leader in America and said, what if you could get 20% more than you're getting. Like, what if you could tap this market, Mike, like from a market size? What if just from a business? Okay, let's take take the pure human element and you go. Everybody, every business is looking for new markets to build and expand on. And you go, the stat that you just shared, Sarah, goes 20% of the population that 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 if we just embrace this right thing to do thing, you can get access to that. And imagine. Just from a pure business standpoint, that market that's served better than any, they get anywhere else, they're going to talk. 
they're going to share, do business here, do work here, because they're going to be your most vocal evangelist. So Mike, like from a pure business standpoint, I go, let's add it to the thing. Cause this stat is like, we all think about the new markets that we could try to break into, you know, or grow Sweet. our existing thing. And you all just said, by the way, everybody hey, you know, has a hard time with the subject, but we're giving you a huge part of the population you could serve extremely well. Again, yes, massive opportunity. And you know, we have so many conversations where we will um, sit and deliberate over customer journeys or you know, how to adjust content in a way to gain just that slight advantage, that percentage change, that 1%, 2% change in conversion or experience improvement. And here's an opportunity, if you really think about it, to cater to a, you know, one in four people in the United States, that's a dramatic improvement. And and that alone justifies, you know, thinking about this start to finish. It's just an incredible opportunity again. Uh, it's a no brainer. I've told you all, I want Modern Tribe to do some stickers around these things that I've heard is like core values should be accessibility, but it's yeah. also like, Hey, uh, I got a secret. Do you want to grow your business? Do the right thing. <laughs> like just we'll serve as shirt. <laughs> yeah, get it on the shirt. Cause I need a shirt for that. You know, I'm a, I'm a swag geek, Mike, but anyway, I digress. <laughs> So, we are too. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I th I think that's another thing I've learned from y'all too is like, hey, we can be, this can be a subject that we get kind of tense about because we don't know all the answers. What I got from you, Sarah, was uh, you took, I think you took a big, big load of perfectionism, expectation, worry, fear off people and released them to say, care about it, get your team. Yes. Like that's the two I got when you're looking at design and that doesn't mean just the design team. That means the people who are out there publishing content on the website Absolutely. too, you know, lean on your team and don't exclude anybody, include everybody in this conversation and it matters. Anything else, Sarah, on design and creativity you wanted to share? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll echo, I think a lot of what we've already talked about, but if you could just, at the end of the day, it's, it's about putting yourself in those folks shoes. And if I think a great place to do that is by talking to those people, testing those people. Um, I, I think that's something that we, we don't, you know, as a, um, a, a world <laughs> uh, probably do enough of. Um, and so empathy, 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 just, you know, do the right thing um, and, and make it a value that you actually follow through with. Um, yep. Okay. I know you're going to have more to share. Thank you for sharing the creativity. I think those are yeah. powerful messages that can release and really free people up to use that creativity, use that, those innovative skills in such a really cool way. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about leadership, talked about creativity and design. Now let's talk about the nuts and bolts, how this stuff works. Like Chris, uh, so you're back in, I know you work a lot with your team, uh, Sarah's team, Mike's team, um, in delivering to the client. Um, when we talk about development, and you, you've you've surprised me a couple times on this, but and, but it's it's something that we just see. It's because you care about the subject, you know, you care about this work. But you've been able to give some really good perspective too. But when we kind of venture into this third phase for subject about accessibility, it's the technical side. What sticks out to you? Uh. I always start with, you've got to make it part of your culture. And in order to do that, that means that when you're hiring, you've got to actually be looking to make sure that you're hiring people that believe the same. And uh, it's very difficult to always create great accessible things if the, the people you're looking at to bring on board don't believe the same thing. So it starts kind of there. It starts with making sure you get the right people in the right seats and, and that uh, piece of it. Um, after that, there's a little bit of understanding why, why we're doing this. And um, one of the things that I like to kind of explain is that you know, accessibility over time has become the norm for, for so many places. Um, think about it as uh, curb cutouts right at crosswalks. Um, 
it's so that it's easier for wheelchairs to get up onto the sidewalk. And, and it's such a normal thing to see now. Um, when you're getting ready to cross the street and you hit the, the walk button, when it changes, it makes a noise. Well, it's because people found out, hey, we need to make this more accessible for other people. And, and they need to be able to get from one side of the street to the other. And it, it, it just, it, it becomes part of your everyday interaction. And it becomes so normal that it, it, it just becomes part of what you do. The same applies building a website. The same applies for the technical side of these things. When you're building a form, you just, it, it, it is, it, it has to be ingrained in your culture that that's the normal way of doing it, that you build it as an accessible form. And you don't cut corners where um, somebody that's not building it accessible or maybe somebody that doesn't know or is ignorant of how to build it accessible um, would, would be doing that. You know, um, Braille is another great example of having like uh, Braille inside a building trying to find where a, um, a, a hotel room is or an office is, that kind of thing. You, it, it becomes normal and therefore you start implementing it, you come to expect it. And that's, that's a big piece. I just want to jump in there, Chris, because I think the part that ties this all together is the fact that those items you mentioned, which were initially built for accessible purposes, how, how many other benefits have they shown to perhaps people with different forms of uh, disability or just really anyone? Like a curb cutout has, has become a convenience. Um, the noise, I often just can hear that and it becomes a benefit to my experience not being a disabled person. Um, and, and so those, those changes have, have become innovations for all of us. You, you mentioned a really good point there. Um, there's different levels of uh, disability, let's say. Yes. Um, you, you've got permanent disabilities, which are, are people that, that aren't going to get over whatever disability they have. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you also have, uh, you know, that's uh, loss of limb kind of thing, maybe not being able to type, not being able to hear, not being able to see, those kinds of things. Uh, you also have a concept of a temporary disability. Uh, we, we've all experience things like getting your eyes dilated and not being able to look at a website that that can really mess with your mind a little bit if if a website has all the text way too close together say you need to call your uh, eye doctor right after you left and you pull up their website on your phone and you can't find the phone number because wow. you your eyes are dilated um yeah yeah and there there's also this concept of situational disability, um, very similar, but uh, say you're sitting next to your four-year-old and on the couch and you're flipping through videos on your phone and you have the volume off because you don't know what somebody's gonna say and you don't want your four-year-old to hear it. Um, you know, that, that's another case of an opportunity that if they have transcripts on that video, all of a sudden you know what they're talking about without having to maybe have your four-year-old say where they shouldn't. Um, yeah, it, the, there's there's this other concept around situational disabilities um, that I kind of hits home with me in particular because um, there's this level of like your emotional state when you're looking at a website. Um, maybe your your ability to actually have like all the right, be in the right state of mind when you're going to a, a website. And it, uh, it, my, my daughter was born with a congenital heart defect. She was life flighted from the hospital three days after she was born to a hospital five hours away. Um, my wife went with her on, on the life flight and we were extremely thankful she was able to, but uh, here we are, I'm, I'm five hours away. I'm getting ready to get in the car. There was a blizzard that night. There, there was just all kinds of things going on. And I've got to try to figure out how to get to this hospital and how to um, find my family, my newborn baby, it, uh, all of this stuff. Uh, Eric Meyer does a very good talk on this. Um, I, I think it was a, a list of part talk, some, something like that. Um, 
but it, it is a, a, a it, it specifically talks about, uh, I think, designing in a crisis or designing for crisis. And, you know, if, if your mind's not where it needs to be to read the information on a website and you're looking for how to get to an emergency room from the airport and you're scrolling through a website, I, I know websites pretty well. I've been reading websites my whole life. And I know that normally there's an address in the bottom left or right side of most websites. But if you're trying to do that, looking through tiers, it's much more difficult. And so there's this level of um, just because th there's this level of morality that we talked about before. It's the right thing to do, but also it, it's, it doesn't, it can apply to anybody at any point in time. And you want to make sure you're being inclusive of all of those potential situations, especially when it's, um, you know, good or, or bad, or, you know, education has alerts and all kinds of, there's just, it, it permeates through the entire industry. So before I come back to, to you, Chris, because I want you to put uh, what the question I'll ask for when I digress for a second with Sarah is uh, think about the technical person on the other side in that seat and the challenges they have. But, you know, Sarah, you, you do design, you know, you think about from the purpose of a website, if I'm an ER, I mean, Chris, you just said 100% of people on that website, what do they want to know? How to get to that building as fast as humanly possible. So, Sarah, from a pure design, UX, UI, that's the purpose of a website, is it not? Like, get people to the thing you – and your situational uh, uh, experience, Chris, made me think, like, that's let's, – let's take aside for a second accessibility. That's just what you want to do with a website. Like, Absolutely. how do I – they are hunting. How do I put it right in front of them? You know what I'm saying? Like, from the design no side. <laughs> yes. Like, you know your audiences all of them prioritize, you know, and, and ensure that you're talking to them, you're listening to them, you're testing that work and you know that it's going to be there in, in a variety of situations. It's not just about slapping your brand on a website. It's about ensuring that that experience is meeting users where they're at and serving their needs and, and um, understanding the tests they need to complete and, and designing to that. Um, like I go back to what you said, and this is reverberating now and how deep well, what you said earlier is good accessibility is good design. And you go, I mean, we can take it aside all of this and just go, that's the purpose. You want to get people to the thing they need to do. You want to empathize. You the word you used earlier, Sarah, too. It's like, empathize. what are they trying to get done? Okay. I'm a, whatever the organization, Chris, you just laid it out. It's blindingly obvious. The location, think about that for restaurants, think about that for any any business, any organization, nonprofits, like they come to you, by the way, and they're looking for something and as fast and efficiently as you can get that to them. So I go back to your comment. Now it's even more deeper. It's like good accessibility is good design because it's about the action you're trying to help that person get to, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would even take it a step further and say good accessibility is usability. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's not just the design, but it, it's, it's the total package of it. It's, it's making sure that that button, when it's clicked, you know, it was clicked and that it's not going to do something unexpected, you know, taking, taking it back to a technical point of view, you know, making sure to know how to make sure a screen reader is announcing that button that it mm -hmm. was clicked, um, making sure that, uh, the, the person knew what that button was going to do and not just say, click here, you know, that making it clear that that's what was going to happen when that button was clicked is a key aspect to it. So Mike, and I just I go think, back down. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. Sarah. I was just going to go back to like what Mike said earlier about like, there's also like kind of these like side effects that are good side effects when you, when you design, um, um, whatever the experience is, whether it's a curb or a website, um, to be accessible, you have all these 
additional benefits for folks that may not have disabilities. So like in the case of the, um, the, you know, the button to call the ER is not visible. Well, what if you designed it to be? Well, I bet you're gonna pick up not just ensuring that like it's accessible, but also a lot of users who may not have disabilities um, still struggle to find things on websites. So like, you know, they'll be able to get their tasks done um, faster too. I know it's a very hyper-specific example, but but it does help provide like context, this bigger idea, right? Hey, Sarah, I think, no, it's a, like proving you all's point is it, it, let's add another one, Mike, to the first part you said, let's add another one. If, if you only use accessibility as to make your site the best converting, most efficient tool for communicating to your customers, we just like backed into, uh, because you, we've all gone back to these, like the usability thing. If you're forced to look at like, okay, let's pull up JAWS or whatever tools you all use and recommend for your clients. And let's, let's go at it from that perspective. You've empathized with the customer and you think, if we just put it under marketing or sales, I go, this is the exercise most organizations should be doing because you're going to go to the level and you're going to have to think about, I'm just talking the business case. Okay. Yeah. Every website needs to spur an action. Like we're trying right. to lead them to something. It could be a sale. It could be the address of the emergency room. It could be whatever it is. I just go from the business case, Mike, like this is an exercise all of us should be doing because if you're in Chris's situation, you're like, isn't it clear, everybody? Everybody in the room know what the key thing here is. We're trying to get people to the emergency room physically. That yeah. informs design. It informs technical. But there's another business case we should add. Absolutely, yeah. And it's really inspiring to like see the conversation. I think as an entire in the across the world evolve from being one where like the the, the talk that that Chris just provided, it, it probably used to have just been about like how to use like alt tags, like 10 years ago, it would have been like, how do we tag content? And now it's, it's crossed into like more of a full philosophical understanding that, Hey, this is, this is, um, this is good business. This is a usability opportunity. This is a chance to empathize with our users. This is a chance to, um, improve, customer and user journeys and and uh, make it easier for you to check out or to get the information that you need um so it's i just um, it, it, i i'm i like that the dots are starting to be connected and that this conversation has changed from just like a very sort of niche technical how do i do these things that i have to do because otherwise i'm going to get in trouble to look at all of this opportunity that we have to incorporate this thinking to better serve our audience that affects that improves our business and makes everybody happier i mean uh, it connects a lot of dots it's cool I, i'm not exaggerating but maybe we should rename this panel to how to build a successful <laughs> website yeah <laughs> i mean i, I know that, i'm exaggerating sure. a little bit but i go like when you were talking through that sarah i thought that is a focusing feature. It makes us ask the question, what's this all about? What are we trying to do? Well, if we can hit it in all these scenarios, we've crystal, we use it as an exercise, honestly, to crystallize what we're trying to get from it and pave the way. Like that's the purpose of a website, right? Okay. So, Absolutely. okay, I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm just hearing what you're saying and going, <laughs> yeah, we should totally, I think the other title is, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity. You know? Yeah. Okay, sure. Chris, I have veered all the way, but I think it's been good. <laughs> we need this out in the world. We need people to hear these things and I appreciate you all sharing so authentically with this. So back to the question, Chris, I'm gonna get back to you. So from a technical standpoint, there's on your clients, you've you've talked to a number, I mean, number of teams in the technical side. And you know, part of my question here is trying to help the leaders listening the other people, the other parts of this team understand there are issues like Sarah did for design that designers have. There's some more technical. What are the things that stick out to you? You know, those challenges people, the technical side has when they're working on this particular subject of accessibility. Uh, I, I would say it's, it's keeping up with the changes as they come. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's one of the big ones. Uh, you know, there, there are different requirements 
those there's more stringent requirements when it comes to uh, WCAG, which is if you're a front end developer and, and back end developers too, uh, knowing what the requirements are to hit certain levels, depending on kind of going back into the legal side of it, you're, you're certain you're going to be required to hit a certain level of accessibility and knowing what those are and how they change over time is a big piece of it. And uh, at, at Modern Tribe, we really lean a lot on our front end developers for keeping up with that, but also we communicate as a whole and, and we make sure that everybody's you know doing code reviews for each other and, and that kind of thing to make sure that uh, if there is an accessibility um, item that we address it before it goes out and that uh, those kinds of things. So it, it, I would say the the biggest issue is trying to just stay relevant with those um, accessibility changes. Every time a browser comes out with something new, you've got to kind of go back and look at it and see if it changed the way you need to implement something based upon those accessibility requirements. So, yeah. So, the from, so from the technical side, there's how, how any general guidance you'd give for how to kind of stay a touch. It would seem to me, you know, from a team standpoint is we just regularly have the discussion, like the topic comes up regularly enough. How or that is, but those developers that want to contribute, technical people that want to contribute to it, any any thoughts there about how they could try to keep up and places to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's, we we use a lot of different tools and, and that kind of thing, but you can always go to the WCAG website and, and that's going to tell you exactly what you need to hit and, and how to perform certain actions in an accessible way. Uh, but but there's also some other things out there. Um, uh, IAAP certifications. Uh, th this is a um, it, it's a uh, they offer a web accessibility certification that you can get, and uh, it it teaches you about web accessibility, and you can go through the whole whole process there. And uh, you know, there's no better way to prove that accessibility is serious to you than getting some kind of certification for sure. Um, it's it's not a, an easy thing to do. There, there are other certifications out there too. Um, that's just the first one that came to my mind. But uh, the, those types of certifications are are nice to be able to go out and do and, and learn. Um, and if you're making it part of your culture, then you're always talking about it. It's it's like, like I said, it's part of those code reviews. Um, if, if I'm, reviewing somebody's code and I'm, I'm seeing it, I'm learning too. If they implemented something that I may not have been aware of yet, uh, that, that's a big piece as well. So mm -hmm. that, that being able to communicate back and forth about them uh, is also super beneficial. Mike, did you have something to add? Probably jumped the gun a little bit. I, I think I was going to start to mention tooling a little and its role in this and, and Chris hit it a, a touch there, but um, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a, a open conversation. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's something that it you have to kind of revisit periodically and the, the tooling, one of the things that it does besides kind of educate you and their their job is to stay current on creating a system of scans that um, enforces certain standards, um, it, it, it allows you to kind of revisit it on a regular basis. Uh, and that there is some, there's a huge role for that, right? Like it, no, no human can actually stay on top of all of the changes at all times. The, that provides some nice rails and yeah as we get into this perhaps this last section in a moment where we talk about the the, the content publishing or the sort of the the end user role in accessibility um, I think that tooling is a, a key part of that as well okay so I want to ask Chris one more thing so this whole banner is accessibility for sure but WordPress accessibility I think that's the two parts of this why i asked you all to do this particular topic because 
you know accessibility, but you also know the nuances with WordPress. Like your experts, Tribe has been around for a very long time doing some really cool stuff with WordPress forever. So, uh, Chris, my question is now accessibility with WordPress, things that come out to stand out with you with this amazing open source software that we love that's used around the globe and it's great solutions for clients. Um, what things stick out there with WordPress accessibility, particularly? Uh, well, first, Open source software, it, it is always, um, it, people are always talking about accessibility. If you go into the, the WordPress Slack, you can see people trying to focus on accessibility and try to get accessibility into uh, everything. Uh, you know, I guess it was two or three years, Gutenberg did a big accessibility audit on all the blocks. And that was really important for WordPress to be doing to help move the editor itself forward and make it more accessible for content editors. Um, but as Gutenberg's matured and, and become the block editor, it's, it's become everybody's focus. There's this new opportunity. And, and I think that uh, as we continue to implement these accessible designs that our, our amazing designers have put together and, and our developers have gone in and, and put a lot of work behind the templates and building out the header and the footer and, and everything, there's this, uh, there's this content piece that is going to have to be implemented. And most of the time that's by the client. And the, the best way to help them would be by creating plugins that test the accessibility before it's ever even published. And being able to interface with a service that allows you to check that and give feedback in a meaningful way to a publisher and being able to tell them this is inaccessible and here is why, because that's a key point too, making sure they know why so they don't always have to fix it every time they do it. Um, it and, and being able to flag that, the way the editor works now compared to the way it worked with the classic editor, it, it gives you so many more opportunities for that kind of uh, benefit. So, so creating a, a plugin, you know, it, it's something that I, I know a few places have tried to create these and, and there's, there's an opportunity to be able to, to do that. And I, I really, I'm looking forward to uh, potentially participating and creating a plugin that can handle that kind of thing. Um, you know, flagging it, uh, checking it from the front end side, all of those kinds of things for a user um, that, that would be a, a huge benefit to the community as a whole and, and to content creators. I, I think you pointed out something that I often don't, I, I kind of gloss over, but the fact that there's so many people, the power of WordPress is so many people collaborating and caring about yes. this. This isn't a new thing to WordPress. It's what I, is we're, we're imperfect, but as a community, and the core software has a very passion for diversity, equity, inclusion. And that conversation has been championed by people like you and others in the community to make sure WordPress is always accessible. But having said that, there's still things. There's still things that we need to account for. And you brought those up as like, well, we did in the discussions. It's like you can do all the front end work and then you're down to the person that just hasn't had the opportunity to be trained a little bit. And the block editor there are things that need that are being discussed actively and worked on in the community to need to be done to ensure the other part of this. We got the great first site, but now, okay, we're turning it over. And I, I think it was Sarah mentioned in one of the previous conversations, you know, a blog post could, could break the accessibility. You know, one thing that we just, because you have so much power, I mean, it's the beauty of Gutenberg and the blog editor. You have so much opportunity there. You also have an opportunity to kind of go into and break your, all your good work you've done to try to be accessible. Okay, anything else on technical? And then I want to dive in with the remaining time and thank you all for your time and sharing your expertise so openly. Um, the next section just about that side of this whole thing is like the other part of the team that might not be in some of the core conversations, but are executing, doing the work. Anything else, Chris, though, before we shift gears into that? Uh, technical is such a code dependent thing that it could get I, I could drown you in what aria labels mean and why and why not but you know the fact is if you 
put a culture in place around accessibility, then it, it's it's something that your devs are going to be able to help you with, and uh, it, it's it's just part of part of the process. I've heard. I, I think another theme in all this is like if you're a designer developer on the team in some way. Uh, this is your webinar to go back if you need help and reinforcements saying, hey, we need to embrace this. Um, because I know so many talented designer developers, good hearts, want to do the right thing, need the resources, you know, yeah, need yeah. that collaboration. Be champions of, yeah, making sure this, this is a conversation um, and and feel empowered to like take that up words towards towards leadership yeah and share this link afterwards so they yeah. can come in here let's talk about <laughs> the yeah. amazing opportunity they have here yeah okay thanks chris all right so final section is just this part you've done all the front end work you do care you're doing all the efforts but then there's this situation you already mentioned that they could break it on that particular page because of the power of some of the work and and the lack of the resources and training and guidance so when we get to this side the client publishing of all of this who wants to share what do you got locked and loaded i want to just kind of put it here because i think this is another team collaboration of like probably people that are oftentimes overlooked blamed sometimes and just don't have this side of it that we need to be thinking about from leadership all the way down through the organization yeah, this is a, a really important part of it that oftentimes gets overlooked. Um, and that is just to be really clear, it's that after these tools have been created, a lot of accessibility thinking has gone into them and then they are delivered to um, you know, a, a, a content publisher to, to maintain and to use for, for possibly up to five years. Um, you're at this key point where as a, maybe an agency partner supporting someone, like you're putting a lot of that power into their hands now to pick up that, that, that torch and continue to run with it. Um, and there's a really unfortunate metaphor here, which is, you know, MySpace. You know, we can all re recall MySpace. It was really great, no longer exists today. They were very well intended. And at some point it went from being this nice tidy page with a profile to music blaring and the, thousands of like scrolling pages and things jumping out all over. And that's because there was not enough rails put into place for content publishers to be su su successful for the long haul there. So we've, we've sort of come to the realization, and this is kind of part of like ergonomic thinking and, you know, you have to set these content publishers up for success. And the way that you do that is, not only in how you're architecting the system, the publishing environment, um, to give instruction, to make it just like intuitive and easy to use and sort of like heuristic and you can kind of just, you can figure it out, it's simple. Um, but like training them on the idea of publishing accessible content because we, no matter how many guardrails we put into place, if you're not thinking about it, you will eventually break the system by putting in, you know, content that is not accessible. Uh, so we try to incorporate that into our training process um, and, and let, let be pretty candid up front to say, you've got a, a wonderfully accessible site right now. It won't be this way if you put in concerning content with you know strange things that, that perhaps like in the moment feel really exciting, but you know, they're, they're not gonna, they're not gonna work from an accessibility standpoint. It's something you need to continue to think about. Um, that, I mean, this goes that's back part of it. Yeah. This goes back to your, your part. And two is the leader and the people making the decisions need to think about all of this, that, okay, part one is just getting the infrastructure, the, the base part two is people have to operate within that base and we need to be considerate and give ample resources to to hear because all of our good intentions could go away yeah. when when inadvertently someone who does care makes a makes a decision that affects it so putting yep. that into the process is is huge and i think i've heard variously you three talk about the training and the ongoing maintenance and upkeep of your knowledge about how these things operate um, isn't a very important part of all of this. 
Um, yes. Chris, you mentioned tooling, or I think Mike got into tooling too earlier. So that seems to be one part, as I've talked to you all, part of this is like just proper tooling to do some as much as we can as this continues to evolve and change with browsers and different technology and stuff. But so can you talk to me a little bit about the tooling side? Yeah. Uh, so tools we use, um, we use site improve, DubBot, um, some of those that what they'll do is they'll actually go out you put your, put the URL in there and it will scrape your site and tell you what kind of um, accessibility issues come up. Uh, they're, they're great tools. That, that kind of thing helps a lot. And, and you can automate that process to run weekly, daily, monthly, however often you want it to. Uh, and, and that's a really great check. But I, I really feel like you should be doing something before that. And, and the easiest way to do that is by installing a browser extension on, you know, if you're using Chrome, Chrome has Axe and you can install Axe on your on your browser and then you can go pull up your page and it's going to tell you the same stuff, but you're just going to catch it before somebody else did, you know, make it part of your publishing process that you publish a page, go pull up X on, on the front end and make sure that there's not a glaring problem. Um, when then, you're dealing I, with, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say even, even before that, um, too, it's it's the training aspect that that we mentioned earlier. Um, you know, from a kind of content side of things, establish guidelines and and make sure that they're accessible by everyone on your team that's creating content, and that they're updated regularly um, as things change and evolve with um, within the accessibility world. Um, so people are are making good content from the start. So we looked at it a little bit backwards, but I, I, I like that because it, yeah, it kind of leads back to that, that person. The two sides are, it seems like tools and training, the two yeah. sides of the airplane, you know? Um, so the, there's, is, there's one more piece that I would want to mention is that you can always fix what's in the editor. It, it's not, it, you didn't just destroy your site forever because you posted one piece of content that was, uh, that had an accessibility problem. Evaluate it, go back in and fix it. It's not, it, the, the whole point is being aware. It's when yeah. you didn't go back and fix it. it. It's knowing it was there and ignoring it. Those kinds of things that will really get you going along a bad path. Right. I mean, people are going to make mistakes. In fact, I'm assuming at some point someone will look back at this webinar and think, they said something incorrect. Um, the point is that we care and we're <laughs> we're trying to do the right thing. Um, and and so I think you're right, Chris. Like going back, if someone identifies an issue, you can fix it. I mean, that's the best thing about this. It's nothing set in stone here forever. <laughs> that is the beauty of the web. I used to be in new newspapers, and when you printed a mistake, it went out. <laughs> oh, I can't <laughs> imagine. We had this opportunity to make it, to fix it, go back and fix it. Um, well, I, I like that. Any other thoughts on the training and tooling side? Um, making sure, you know, I, I assume in all this when you're we're talking about like checklists and workflows, like making sure this is things you do with clients is like, hey, there's somebody in not in this meeting and hasn't been privy to all this. Here you go. Here's some basic stuff to look at. I don't know if that's style sheets. I don't know if that's like you, earlier you talk, you know, Sarah, about like the colors of your logo. And then how does that translate, translate accessibly? And uh, Chris, again, any, anything like that you think as you're, you've been working with clients for a long time with this particular thing, what you do that kind of makes the difference for someone, you know, are there style guides? Are there typical things they do? How do you approach this from a client's perspective on that training? Like, do you build in Mike, you know, um, training with the team, I, you know, anything on that regard? I, I could probably add one more thing, which is that, you know, there's a lot of intention in the, in the design and the construction of content. So if you do that right, the, the publisher's experience is pretty like straightforward. It's about the quality of the content and the messaging and less the construction of it. And therefore like there's less opportunity to get creative at that point. 
you're, you're sort of like focused on like what the message, the content's trying to convey is and not so much how that looks and where it positions. Or if you do have some editorial power at that point, it's from a predetermined set of, of configurations. So you're like putting the content in and flipping levers and hitting buttons from pre-approved standards that everyone was agreed to, in agreement on and happen to be accessible. Um, so if that that work up front has been done well, those are some of those guardrails, and I, I think that that can that can help continue success into the future. That's where Gutenberg has made things so much easier for for us. Uh, we can go in and create patterns and build out those patterns to be accessible and and meet a certain um, layout that. Sarah's teams provided the front end to to be able to do and and so we've we've said okay here's here's a pattern you can use that we've already vetted as an accessible pattern and and you don't have to worry about it if you use this pattern you're good and then you can use the next pattern you're good and and you can kind of work your way down the page that way and it, it makes yeah. things better for the end user and you know that's that's everybody's goal here how can we do what's best for the end user using WordPress to publish, and then in turn, their users coming to the website. All right, anything else on that and before we do some takeaways? I think that pretty much <laughs> covers it. This has been like, I think it's beyond primer. What this is, is helping want somebody that does want to care, that cares take some meaningful steps about holistically embracing this um, and with really solid business and human reasons attached. And I think part of this that I was surprised a little bit is just the thinking when we got into accessibility, it's like, actually, you can, you can make money doing the good thing, doing the right thing. Um, maybe more money, because we've talked about the one in six, one, one in four in America in particular, but and in, in, in the situational that you did, Chris, permanent situational, temporary, Mike really sharing um, the that that whole case to help us think about that. Um, so I, I love it. And I think the big headline is don't look at this as a problem. Look at it as an opportunity. And I think you all have masterfully shared some really compelling you can't look away from reasons why this should be at the center of not just the project, not just the website, part, but culturally as a, as an organization, how we're going to be in the world. And I think it's pretty, pretty awesome. Anything we missed, anything you want to share um, that we didn't touch on? Uh, I'll just like my final thought on this was, first of all, again, thank you, Corey, for, for recording this. I, I like the opportunity to sometimes approach these topics from a new angle and, and specifically as it relates to accessibility, there's been a lot of talks in accessibility and a lot of times they do get pretty in the weeds um, because that's an important part of this is understanding the weeds and the, the specifics. Um, but what I was what really drew me to this conversation was the ability to take a step back and, and think about uh, this topic more holistically as it relates across all the layers of culture and business um, both like at a working with an agency partner, but in your own organization and how doing that um, can ultimately bring you a lot of success. So I appreciated the new angle on it. There, Chris, any, any save takeaways or thoughts? Yeah, I think like my, my biggest kind of takeaways are how critical it is for, um, you know, organizations to truly like resource for this it, don't you know it's, it's kind of that idea of like show don't tell like make it part of your values sure but then show it right and 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 put resources towards it i think that um is a critical step <laughs> in making sure this is truly valued um at your organization and that you're connecting with your your audiences uh, i i really agree uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but you know, I, I think Mike talking along the points of there's a bunch of talks out there about accessibility from a technical point of view, from uh, how to implement and and those kinds of things. But I, I think one of the places that struggles the most is um, organizations understanding that it costs a lot of money to do that, 
And it, it costs a lot of money because they've been going at it the wrong way. And they've been coming at it from kind of an inside out, not an outside in, and not mm -hmm. making it like Saracen, not making it part of your culture. And if you can make it part of every piece, it's not it's not going to be as expensive as it is if you have to remediate something once right. it's all done. Uh, so it, it's um, this has been very eye opening to me. To I, I don't think many people are looking at it from this direction, and I I uh, am am excited to be a part of that. Well, thank you three for sharing uh, so openly uh, your expertise and experience about this pretty vital you know topic that if we're working on the web is just a fact it's and we've illustrated some good points but I appreciate you all for being and sharing so openly and taking your time i know it's it's a friday now as we're recording but um you have you have those clients waiting on you mike would you share a little bit how can someone heard what you all have shared and start the conversation with modern tribe yeah, for sure. If anybody has a, a follow on question or wants to talk to Modern Tribe about the work that we do, um, our website is uh, tri.be. Um, so you can Google search Modern Tribe. We pop up around there on the first couple responses. Um, you can also reach me at hello at tri.be. And, um, you know, our goal is to be helpful. So I, I and really, we do this quite often. If you just have a question, we're happy to to just, just talk about stuff. So it doesn't always have to be reaching out if you have a, a new project opportunity. This is important to us. We like to hear from people and uh, yeah, build relationships with everyone in the space. So that's how you can reach us. And and thanks again, and Corey, and then and, and the work that Post Status is doing, carrying these topics through uh, to the audience. It's really, really important. Yeah, I think we've got a couple more talk, topics to pull back because I've, I've already identified some ones that I want to go. I go, I think there's more here that I kind of hear, heard that like it may be warrant more a specific treatment. So, but Sarah, Chris, Mike, thank you for today. Appreciate your time, what you do in WordPress and the larger world uh, out there. So have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you for being here. Cheers. Good talk.